fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Ohio silver, the Lone Ranger. and resourceful mask rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fellow. I'll Silver. Away! Jess Patton, promoter and land speculator, smiled confidently as he entered the office of Commissioner Harvey, head of the government's Territorial Railroad Commission. Hello, Commissioner. I received your letter this morning. I came over here as soon as I could. I will see, Mr. Patton. Oh, thank you. Well, when do I give my men the word to start? I'm sorry, Mr. Patton, you don't. Mm-hmm. That's right. Your bid to build a railroad branch from Central City to Galeville was high. The job went to someone else. Well, who got it? One of the big eastern roads? No, the Galeville and Central City line. Hmm? Well, there's no such road. Well, there is now, Mr. Patton. It was started with government approval by the businessmen and cattlemen in this territory. They've invested their own money in the project. Businessmen? Cattlemen? What do they know about railroading? They've hired some expert railroad men to supervise the building of the road. And I may add, the government is satisfied that they'll succeed. However, if the Galeville and Central fail in the job, you may have an opportunity to bid again. A few hours later, after an investigation of his own, Jess Patton met with his longtime aide, Blackie Gilroy. He outlined the situation and concluded... Oh, he was right. They have good top men working for them. Amos Pike is president, for instance. Well, he sure doesn't like you, boss. I will not talk about that. And somehow they got Ross Taylor to oversee all construction work. I learned that they do need foremen and laborers, though. So I sent for you. Well, I'm here. Railroading is your business, Blackie. You're a good foreman when you want to be. That's why I hired you in the first place. Yeah, but you can't hire me for this new job because these other fellas have it. You're going to work for them, Blackie. Me? For them? Yes. They need experienced foremen. Get yourself a job there. Do a good one. Blackie Gilroy reported to Jess Patton the next evening. Hey, you were right, boss. They needed foreman band. I signed up like you told me. I start tomorrow. And <laughs> I can pick my own gang. During the months that followed, work on the railroad proceeded with great success. The stockholders and officers of the road, intense in their local pride, made regular monthly tours of inspection of the work already completed. 
Now, two days before the next official inspection, Amos Pike, the railroad president, appeared on the scene and checked work progress with Supervisor Ross Taylor. Taylor, they're doing a splendid job. We'll prove to the government and the big railroads that you don't need to waste millions to build a road. And how far have you progressed with the track lady? Mr. Pike, we have a crew ready to place tracks on the trestle over Eagle Canyon. So soon? That's amazing. I thought it would take at least another month to complete that job. The men have been working hard, sir. Blackie and his men should have the track laid by tomorrow or the next day. Blackie? <laughs> he sounds like a pirate. <laughs> he looks like one, too. But he's been a great worker on this job. Before he joined us, he worked for Jess Patton. Patton, huh? Yeah. Now there's a real pirate. A bad, dangerous man. So I've heard, Mr. Pike. But Blackie Gilroy's a good one. At least he has been for us. At that moment, Blackie Gilroy, with the hulking man, Tim Bear, known as Grizzly, were meeting with Jess Patton. They were in the hills to the west of Eagle Canyon. Uh, boss, I think this is the spot to do what you have in mind. Yes, so do I, Blackie. We'll have the track across the trestle by tomorrow night. What about the work track? You want to destroy that, too? Yes. That represents a lot of money. A work train, an engine, plus a completed bridge. <laughs> I'd say that'll give them quite a job. Well, yeah. <laughs> Set them back a month to six weeks. Getting the material to start the new trestle will take a few weeks. Easy. Things have been running smoothly. I'd uh, like to keep out of this altogether. Well, you don't have to be mixed up in it, boss. Well, I'm thinking about the conclusions that might be drawn if the bridge is blown up. If there was some way that it could be destroyed and give the appearance of an accident... Uh, that's easy. Easy? To make the destruction look like an accident? Sure. I'll burn the bridge. And Grizzly's the one who can do it, boss. He's good at setting fires. Together, Grizzly and I will make sure the bridge burns down. And I'll make sure the work train goes with it. Then that's the way I want it. As long as it looks accidental. When I finally come into the picture, I don't want anyone pointing the finger of suspicion. The next evening at sundown, Foreman Blackie Gilroy finished inspecting the railroad ties that had been laid that day on the trestle across Eagle Canyon. As the quitting whistle blew from the engine of the work train, Blackie suddenly waved his arms in a gesture demanding attention from the work gang. All right, men, all of you. Quiet, eh? Listen. Now, just a minute. Keep quiet while I talk. All right, hold it, fellas, huh? Come on, Blackie. What is it? Men, you're not going back to town on the work train today. What? What do you mean? You're not going to have us stay out here, Blackie. You told well, now, let me finish. I said you're not going back on the work train. You go back by hand cars. Hand cars? Where are they? There aren't any hand cars out this way. The They'll be here any second. I sent Grizzly into camp in town. Taylor will send some cars out because hey, I know... Look, on the other side of the trestle. Yeah, a hand car and another one behind us. Yeah, and the third one. Well, I told you they'd send them out. All right, let's get to the hand cars then. Come on, A few minutes later, Blackie Gilroy and Grizzly Bear watched the last hand car fading in the distance. Blackie laughed. <laughs> well, they're gone. Grizzly, what'd Taylor say when you told him we were keeping the work train out here tonight? Him? Oh, not much. He said you must have a good reason. So he got some men to take the hand cars like you asked me to ask him. Now let's go back to where the engine is. I want to get it out on the trestle. Yeah, sure. But, uh, Blackie... What? I was sick of before. What were you? Huh? Oh, never mind. What were you thinking? Well, I was thinking maybe they'll get wise to us. You know, having the engine and the train out on the trestle when the fire starts and all that. I have a story all set. I even have it set about whose fault it was that the fire started. Yeah, but... Ah, you... stop thinking, will you? You're going to set up these tracks with the fire, aren't you? Yeah, well, sure. Well, then let's get going. I'll have to start down in the canyon part, and that's where the bridge props are. Well, get below, then. You know the road down. I'll get the engine. Just be sure you do everything the way we planned. The Lone Ranger and Toto had been in Central City where they'd acquired provisions. They left the town at sundown and rode along a trail that ran parallel with a new railroad now under construction. 
They reached the edge of Eagle Canyon that night and decided to camp there until morning. A short distance away, they could see a railroad engine and a few flat cars come to a halt on the trestle that bridged Eagle Canyon. Oh, look. That new railroad has progressed much farther than I'd expected. Ah. I've already got bridge cross canyon. Hmm. Well, that's strange. What, Kimothabi? What strange? The engineer has left the cabin of the engine and is walking back to this side of the canyon. Ah. Me see him. Leaving a train out in the middle of the trestle seems strange. Kimothabi, down in canyon. The man under bridge. Where? Oh, yes, I see. Him act funny. He's probably just a workman. Well, I look through my field glasses. Mm-hmm. Up to something down there. Possibly testing bolts, or... Hey, you're right, Toto. His actions are peculiar. Ah. He seems to be piling brush around the wooden foundation structures. There may be a reason for that, but I can't figure what it is. Well, there must be a path down into the canyon somewhere near here. Yeah, me nowhere. If not far, path for down over there. Then we'll use it. I'm interested in what that man is doing. He's just said he'd be gone. Scott, easy fella. Come on, Susan. Get him up, Scott. The Lone Ranger and Toto brought their horses to a stop at the end of the canyon trail. Then they dismounted and continued on foot. Blackie Gilroy, reaching the end of the trestle, saw the Lone Ranger and Tonto start down the trail that led to the bottom of the canyon. He had no horse, but immediately he set out for the canyon trail himself, his hand on his gun as he started downward along the rock-strewn path. I don't know if they saw Grizzly or not, but I'm going to find out. I don't like this. I don't like this at all. The Lone Ranger and Tonto, hidden by the brush, had been watching the movements of Grizzly for some time. Now there could be no doubt about the reasons for his actions. We guessed right, Tonto. He's lighting a torch. See? The gun has set fire to the trestle. Am that right? Let's not give him a chance to start. Come on. All right, you. Stop right there. Drop that torch. Drop it. I said or I'll shoot. Take that torch, Tonto. I only made that close. The next one will hit you. Yeah, yeah, all right, all right. Here, here's the torch. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, now, you, who are you? Why were you starting to set fire to the railroad trestle? I wasn't setting fire. I was your... Drop that gun, what? mister. I'm right behind you, and I'll drill you in the back of your door. Blackie, I didn't know you was there. Shut up. You, Winton, come over here with your partner. Who's he says, Tonto? Uh, Grizzly, take a gun. Yeah, sure. Give me those guns, my ass man, Pronto. Right there. Yeah, turn around now. Yeah, but keep those hands up. They're still high. Now, what are you going to do? Take care of you, mister. Get out of the way, Grizzly. Yeah. I'm going to do some shooting. As Grizzly turned, the Lone Ranger's upraised hands came down suddenly. Now, to open. He pushed Grizzly forward with such force that the man plunged heavily into the chest of his gun-toting partner. At the same instant, the masked man and Indian were upon the crooks. I have this one's gun arm, Toto. The Lone Ranger had grabbed Blackie and was twisting the man's gun arm high into the air so that the crook was unable to press the trigger of his gun. Me take the gun. Now! Tonto, astride the back of Grizzly, who had fallen to the ground, came to his feet, holding one of the guns that Grizzly had taken from him and the masked man. Now, you stand up, sir. Now, get hands up. You too. Nice work, Tonto. Do what he says, mister. And he's shooting, you don't. My hands are right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is your mind. Oh, my back. Now, you clumsy fool, Grizzly, this is your fault. Both of you, turn around and start walking. I'm taking you to the railroad authorities in Central City. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger adventure. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. The Lone Ranger and Tonto left their horses at the spot they had selected as their campsite. They forced Blackie Gilroy to take them to the work camp in the engine, which he handled expertly. But at all times, the Lone Ranger kept Blackie and his partner covered with his gun. At the work camp, Tonto left the engine and sought out Ross Taylor, who came to where the Lone Ranger waited with the two men. He looked at the scene with surprise 
and with suspicion at the Lone Ranger. What is this? What's going on here? This Indian Mr. told me... Mr. Taylor, this is funny. This masked fellow thinks Bisley and I were trying to set fire to the trestle. You were. Now, Mr. Before Taylor, you were. Why are you wearing that mask and holding a gun on my men? Who I am and why I wear this mask is a question I may answer later. Right now, I want to tell you what Tonto and I saw. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll put away my gun. There. Get your hands down, Grizzly. You too, Blackie. Yeah, my arms were getting tired. Now, Mr. Taylor... Keep quiet, Blackie. Let the masked man tell me what this is all about. He put away his gun and seems to be sincere. Go ahead, stranger. Talk. The Lone Ranger told his story, and then Blackie Gilroy gave his version of the situation. Ross Taylor, after hearing both sides, rubbed his chin reflectively and then spoke to the masked man. Stranger, I'm afraid you're wrong. It's good of you to worry about railroad property, as you say you were doing, but I... Uh, Now, Mr. Taylor, I know how important it is to the cattlemen in this territory. I'd hate to see it destroyed. So would we. The people of these parts have invested their money in it. So has the government. We want to protect those investments for many reasons. Then why don't you... Why don't I accept your story about Blackie? Because he's one of the best, if not the best, foreman I have on this job. Grizzly's a good man, too. Stranger, I think it's a case of your both being mistaken. You thought Blackie and Grizzly were crooks, and they thought you were. You mean you're not going to do anything about this? I didn't say that. I have Blackie's word that some men did try to start a fire at the trestle. I'll place a guard at each end of the trestle first thing in the morning. Well, Grizzly and I will do that if you want us to, Mr. Taylor. No, Blackie. The officials and stockholders who were making that monthly inspection trip arrived in camp last night. Oh, I forgot about that. I can't. They're on top of me all the time, wanting to know about our progress. They'll be sure to ask specific questions about the work that's been done on the trestle. I'll need you and Grizzly around to help me give them detailed answers. So stay here, both of you. The train will go over the road about 8 o'clock. You say to stay, Mr. Taylor? We stay. Now, Mr. Taylor, you said you'd place guards at each end of the trestle in the morning. Well, why not now? Because... Uh... <laughs> well, you do have the interest of the road at heart, don't you? All right, I'll send two men out there now on the work engine. And thanks for your attempt to help us, stranger. The guards will take you on the engine back to the park. <laughs> Two guards were sent to Eagle Canyon a short time later that night. The Lone Ranger and Tonto went with them, then left and walked to their camp. Alone, the masked man said, Tonto, no matter what Ross Taylor believed, I'm not convinced Blackie Gilroy told the truth. And me not think so. We see what other men do. Yes, so we're riding back at once to the work camp. We keep out of sight there, but we'll not let Blackie or Grizzly go anywhere that we don't follow. I want to learn more about them. It was long after midnight. The Lone Ranger and Tonto had reached the outskirts of the work camp in Galeville and were about to make arrangements for keeping a lookout there. Suddenly, the Lone Ranger saw a figure emerge from behind a shed and hurry to a nearby stable. Hello, isn't that Blackie? Uh, he thinks so. Look, him come out on horse now. Yes, it is, Blackie. No doubt about it. Otto, stay here and keep an eye out for Grizzly. I'm going to follow that man. He's easy to be fellow. Come on, Silver. Blackie Gilroy, unaware that he had been followed by another horseman, reached the hideout where Jess Patton waited for him. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> As he entered, he saw that the railroad promoter was furious. Why, uh, you bumbling idiot, what happened? Why didn't you set fire to the trestles you're supposed to do? I've watched the skies for hours for some sign of flame. Nothing's happened. Why? Blackie told his story and concluded... And I'd have killed him. Only this masked man pushed Grizzly, and they were on top of us before we could do anything. You should kill that fellow, Grizzly. Lucky I wanted that trestle destroyed. I wanted them to lose that engine. That trestle is a keystone of the entire railroad. I told you we should have used blasting powder. Never mind what you told me. The important thing is, what are we going to do now? We can still blow up that trestle, boss. We'll get the engine and the people who are on it. Manny, Blackie, quick, get your gun, shoot. Shoot who? What? Uh, he's gone. There was someone at the window. I know it. Go out and see. Go on. I didn't see anyone, but I'll look. Blackie searched around the outside of the house and saw signs of no one. He walked back into the cabin and closed the door. Ah, there was no one there, boss. Must have been cloud shadows or something. I could have sworn. 
Well, I am nervous. Perhaps I did imagine it. So, go on. What did you start to say before? I said we can get rid of the trestle and the whole shebang. There's an inspection party in the morning, with all the officers taking a trip along the road and over the trestle. Now, Grizzly and I can get down to the powder shed before they come. The lone ranger who had ridden away when Jess Patton saw him at the window stopped a short distance from the hideout and waited there. Dawn was in the sky when he saw Blackie Gilroy leave and start back toward the work camp in Galeville. Come on, sir. Once more, the masked man rode at a discreet distance behind the crook. Not too fast, Silver. Easy, fellow, easy. Blackie Gilroy arrived back in camp at a moment when the workers there were beginning to awaken. He sought out Grizzly, who had donned his clothes but was still sleepy-eyed. Grizzly, come on outside, quick. Huh? Oh, wait a minute, tell Blake. Come on. on. All right, all right. Come on. Now get out here. Away from the bunkhouse. Here. What's the matter? What do you want? Grizzly, Patton's at the hideout. I just came from there. I got orders. Uh, what can I do? We're going to blow up that inspection train this morning. The one with Amos Pike and the stockholders. Uh, how are we going to do it? Where? You're going to do it. When the train's crossing the trestle over the pass. Now, come on. We're going over the powder shed and get some powder. But there's a man guard in the shed, isn't there? Sure, Pat Morey. But he'll not suspect anything if I take a load of powder out this early. I'm foreman, remember? I'm always getting powder from him. I use more powder out at the pass than anyone the entire outfit. So don't you worry about that part. You want me to plant the powder out at the trestle? Yeah. I'll take care of the guards Taylor sent out there. I'll tell him he sent you and me out to relieve him till the day shift comes. But suppose you tell him what you did? Ah, you worry too much. They'll never get the chance. Because Taylor will be busy with Pike and the rest of the mucky mucks once he gets up. And they'll not be able to tell him later because he and the others aren't going to be alive. They'll be on the train. Now, come on. Let's get a hand car and start out to the pass. The Lone Ranger and Tonto from their watching place saw Blackie and Grizzly talk to the guard in front of the powder shed. The guard allowed the two men to enter. And a short time later, they emerged, each hauling a small crate. They took the crates to a hand car at the siding and started at once out toward the canyon. This is what they talked about in the cabin this morning, Toto. Taking blasting powder out to the trestle. Mm. We go after him. No, not you, Toto. You go to Ross Taylor. Tell him what's happened. Have him check the powder shed and note that neither Blackie nor Grizzly are in camp. I'll ride out to the canyon. There's no time to waste, Toto. When the hand car arrived at Eagle Canyon, Blackie Gilroy summoned the two men who had been guarding the trestle at both ends. He gave them the orders he pretended had come from Supervisor Ross Taylor. And don't report back to Mr. Taylor. He'll be busy trying to get the inspectors out of bed and on the train so we can get that thing over with. Oh. So just go back to bunkhouse then, huh? That's right. Take our hand car and get going. All right. When the two men rode away from the scene on the hand car, Blackie smiled at Grizzly. Ah, you see how easy that was? Yeah. When you're a foreman and a good one like I am, you can get away with anything. People do what you say and believe what you tell them. Now let's get this powder set. The sun was high in the sky when Grizzly finished. Uh, that takes care of it. Powder under every prop leading out from this side and powder in the middle of the track, too. That fuse long enough? Yes, long enough for two minutes. That's what we'll need once we hear the train coming through the cut. Just two minutes. That's right. That's what we figured whenever the work train rolled out here, didn't we? Yeah. Well, Patton's going to get what he wanted today, all right. I think he is. Hey, watch it. Hurry for your gun. Mass Combray again. You, you were behind that rock, huh? Ever since Blackie came back from dismissing the guards, well, well, what are you going to do now? March you two along the track, back towards the train is coming. In less than two minutes, so start walking. Walk, I said. Well, we're going. The two men, hands high in the air, started along the tracks, heading in the direction of the oncoming train. This is far enough. I'm sure they see us. The Lone Ranger could see a number of men in the cab of the engine, and among them was an Indian. Follows with him. Taylor had to believe us this time. Ross 
Taylor, flanked by Amos Pike and other officials of the road, were white-faced as they heard the Lone Ranger unfold his story. And you'll find the blasting powder and fuses in place at this side of the canyon. Ready to go off as a train across the trestle. You uh, sure the powder can't go off now? No, the fuse is never lighted. But, Taylor, you'd better have some men remove those powder charges at once. I'll do that. Stranger, when Tonto told me what was happening, I was skeptical. But when I saw these men had left camp with the powder, I believed him. I have the sheriff here. We'll take charge of these fellows. You'll You'll you'd better them. take charge of a man named Patton, too. He's the one who put them up to this. Jess Patton? Jess Patton was going to have us killed. He only wanted the bridge blown up first. Ah, you stupid ox. The boss will kill you when he hears you mention his name. I don't think he will. Patton is in a cabin not far from here waiting for these men, Sheriff. If you take them there, I think he'll break down and confess. I always said Patton was a bad one. Let me go with you, Sheriff. I want to see him arrested. All right, Mr. Pike. You'll have no trouble with your road from now on, Mr. Pike. Neither will you, Mr. Taylor. So, Todd and I'll leave you. Come, fellow. But, stranger, we owe a lot to you. Not only we who are here, but everyone in the territory. Well, he's not hearing the words you say, Taylor. He and the engine are riding off. He didn't ride off soon enough. We're thankful he didn't. Sheriff, when I told you about the masked man, you acted as if you knew him. Do you? Well, I'd heard of him and what he does. Now I know it's just like I heard. Well, who is he? You didn't tell me. Who else could do so much for so many people and leave without making a fuss about it? Why, Mr. Taylor, anyone would know the only man who does that is the Lone Ranger. is a feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated, created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Muir Incorporated, directed by Charles D. Livingston, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of the Lone Ranger is played by Brace Beamer.